In this presentation, I'm going to make some comments on Bruce Blundy and Mosquitoes Chapter 2, Game Theory 101 in the Predictioneers game. In this chapter, Bruce has started to talk to us about game theory. And in broad sense, putting it in the context of, uh, you know, science and making the point that game theory is an attempt to scientifically approach interactions between people, but that the problem is unlike physics where we have the interactions of particles, interactions between people are strategic. That is to say, people anticipate interacting with others and they know that others anticipate interacting with them and they know that others know that they, and you know, so on and so forth, right? There's this anticipation and uh, this idea that people are acting in some kind of strategic interest. They're anticipating what will happen in an interaction and trying to get the best outcome possible. Now, he does talk about the difference between cooperative and non-cooperative game theory in this chapter. And he presents the, uh, he presents it, a lot of the, the, this chapter and a lot of the book in general, even you know the title about brazen self-interest is kind of a pitch to take this view of the world that uh, assumes that, or that assumes that people are kind of unrestrained and well, they're pursuing their brazen self-interest. And so the difference between cooperative and non-cooperative game theory fits in this. In cooperative game theory, that is about games where there are rules that are enforceable in some way, right? That would be how I would put it. And so, you know, you can, uh, and to, you, you know, if you want to uh, talk about how people are going to play Monopoly or Charades, well, there are rules to what you do in those games. And he makes the point that what you say is what you have to do, right? That your actions and your comments, your what you, uh, the information you provide are the same. In non-cooperative game theory, individuals are not bound by rules. They cannot make enforceable agreements. That was how I always, you know, understood it. That is to say, you can't come into a, uh, uh, you can't come into an interaction and work out with the other person ahead of time. I'll do that if you do this. All right. Uh, and you wake out, you know, and you write a contract and then it's enforceable in a court of law. In non-cooperative game theory, you go in and you're always able to do whatever you want strategy wise and you cannot make commitments to one strategy or another and and or that can in any way be enforced and so people are able to you know work against each other to defect from presumed agreements and so any prior agreement is you know, it's just cheap talk is a technical term because there's no uh, there's no penalty to not upholding it. And he comes in, you know, he has a, 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 a view that this is the way the world is and this is how people are. This is the best way of predicting. Uh, I always went with in international relations, it's anarchy, right? And so there you go, non-cooperative game theory right there. But so there's discussion of this and he says hey we have to talk about what the other guy's interests and beliefs are this is what's important if we are anticipating other people and we're interacting with other people talking about you know how we understand what others do and and honestly what he's talking about here is the assumptions in game theory about the players because we are kind of I don't know if we're objectifying, but we're separating ourselves out and saying, here are players and we're going to model the behavior of people who include us sometimes, but we're going to treat it as, you know, what are, uh, as something apart from us and come up with general rules. And so this question of what is self-interest and what is rational becomes central to this chapter. Okay, the place where the record scratches, and I think a lot of people go, what? is when he starts talking about whether Mother Teresa is rational, right? And Bruce brings this idea, he says, look, everyone is, you know, we want to assume that people are out in this world trying to come up with the best outcomes for themselves. Now, what's that mean? And he says that when you have someone, Mother Teresa is held up as someone who's certainly not out for herself, right? She's a saint. And he says, well, game theory asks, what 
benefits Mother Teresa expected in exchange for her work? That's how he puts it, right? What what benefits did she expect to get? And, you know, did she expect to be rewarded in another life? Did she, you know, uh, and, and he says, look, the idea that she was some humble, you know, that, that she was living according to, uh, you know, kind of religious views of the charitable life or the good life. You know, he gets into a discussion from both uh, Catholic and Talmudic points of view that would argue that, you know, actually Mother Parisa, by being a public persona, by being famous, was not, you know, she wasn't anonymous in what she did and she wasn't giving anonymously to other people. She was picking people. And so he makes that kind of argument. And in, in, in the end, he says that she acted as if being rewarded was her motivation. And that's what's important. Now, and okay, there's there's that point of view. Uh, I view this as kind of a red herring in a way that, look, Mother Teresa was rational given her goals, right? The way I would put it is rationality is about whether you're purposive, right? And so the goal, you know, you can have any goal you want, right? This is the thing uh, in, in the theory. And we'll talk about that a little more in a second. But that is, you can have good goals and bad goals. And, and Bruce goes on to talk about in the context of terrorists and, you know, bad actors, he says, look, you can't treat someone's goals as irrational just because you don't understand them. They have goals. And so he would argue that, you know, Hitler had evil goals. And he says, look, Hitler's actions were rational given his evil aims. Yeah, I'm on board with that. That's the idea. The you know, as long as someone is consistently acting to achieve what they consider to be the better outcome, they're rational. Now, let's take it back to Mother Teresa. You know, if Hitler can have evil goals, can't Mother Teresa have good goals? Can't Mother Teresa's goals in life involve, I don't know, people not starving in Bombay? And you know, so my thing is that we're, we've kind of gotten sideways of it. All, all we have to do, you know, from my point of view, is just say, look, Mother Teresa, for whatever reason, got it in her head that she wanted to do this thing. And it's very laudable that she did. And I don't know why, um, but she, you know, she was working to better the life of people and was very empathic, had a different definition of things. Uh, and yes, there were probably some benefits in there to her. She probably got a warm fuzzy. She got, you know, and, but did she act consistently to achieve those goals? And she very clearly did. And he points out ways, he very excellently points out ways in which she would be considered rational. And the question there is, so rationality to my mind is about purposiveness, not about self-interest. And, you know, I think we get a little bit sideways here with the Mother Teresa discussion. Getting on to the, the requirements of rationality, what Bruce sees as the requirements here are that people, and, and these come very close to the standard things we get when talking about preferences. And the kinds of things like when I talk about what preferences are in slides on, on Gabe, yeah, this is exactly it. Um, he says, look, people must have preferences among choices, right? This is the idea, technical concept of completeness. Their preferences must not go in circles, right? This is the concept of transitivity. And he talks about it exactly the way I like to talk about it. Uh, and I don't know if he, uh, no, I did not learn that part from him. Right? Uh, we both seem to have a Neapolitan ice cream package in our head uh, is, you know, if you prefer strawberry to chocolate and you prefer chocolate to vanilla ice cream, then you should prefer strawberry ice cream to vanilla ice cream, right? It's just transitivity. And so there must be an internal consistency to preferences. And his argument though is finally, rational people act in accordance with their preferences, taking into account the impediments to doing so. So he brings in concepts of strategicness, risk-taking, probability, right? That people are recognizing. And a lot of discussion here in this chapter falls into this concept of, are we talking about instrumental rationality where people are, you know, making decisions with incomplete information, with uncertainty, right? Versus the, what a lot of times is, is 
people think of when they talk about rationality, procedural rationality, where you're calculating everything and you're being very accurate about it or something. Um, but these, you know, that's one requirement he had. And I was kind of like, what happened to fixed preferences? Well, in the end, he talks about what isn't rational. What, uh, and he says, he brings up a lot of things that people have suggested are irrational. And he says, look, first of all, from his point of view, not acting in accordance with preferences is the only thing that's irrational. So the only things in only people in his world that, that seen regularly qualify for this are little children and schizophrenics. That is people who flip flop, right? People who from one minute to the next, you know, one minute they like strawberry, the next minute they hate it. Right. And this is the concept of fixedness, right? That preferences, you know, I would say, uh, technically talking, you know, preferences need to be complete, transitive and fixed. Right. And so that's what he sees as not being rational. He rejects ideas that, you know, the, the typical things, tipping people, giving gifts, and, and he brings up flushing toilets, right, which might be a little uh, weird, and I'll explain that. The idea of tipping, though, is, you know, there's an, there is a psychological argument that people tip based on their self-image, that they want to be the type of person that tips. And so that tipping is not done for any other benefit other than an internal reaction to the thing, right? And um, same thing with gift giving. I, get, I give a gift to somebody, presumably I'm doing it for their benefit because I like them with no benefit to me. Uh, and flushing toilets, by the way, that's a collective action problem, right? The idea of any anything where I have to uh, take actions Right. You know, I'm going to I have to impose a cost. And actually, the, there's more to it than he, in, in that sense that, you know, hey, I'm going to flush the toilet. Um, it doesn't mean that it's going to be flushed when I get back. Right. So it's going to benefit the next person. But I have because I'm not always there to flush the toilet. Uh, I'm not in control of it. I can't guarantee that it's always going to be flushed. And so I may come in and have a dirty toilet. Right. And so. You know, it makes sense. I'll flush the toilet if it's dirty because I don't want to look at that. But, you know, the idea here is it's a collective action problem, uh, the tragedy, the commons, prisoners, dilemma, these sorts of things. And there used to be jokes at University of Rochester that in Harkness Hall, where the econ department was, they didn't flush the toilet because it was a collective action problem. Cute little joke. Uh, we, we found it droll. Uh, nevertheless, he argues that there's a generalized norm that the, that norms like this generally make you better off. So it's kind of an enlightened or generalized long-term self-interest. This is very common amongst people who are really pushing the self-interest concept of rationality. Um, and I don't go all the way with it. You know, there is a lot of psychological research into norm following ideational, you know, things that are not, that are more ideational than material. Uh, and I think they're very interesting, right? Uh, and the, you know, I, I think this approach is denying the validity of that. Uh, and I don't do that personally. However, I have read these guys, you know, I've looked at, uh, it seriously considered this concept of identity-based behavior. And I think it's very important. But even then when they talk about it, Right. The, psych, the, the social psychologists that talk about it, they often have this caveat. You know, they say, look, why does somebody why does one person on the weekend play golf while another person takes their family to the zoo? And they say, you know, why do they pick one option over another reasonably available one? And so this is the key thing. They kind of have this all things being equal. Why do you pick one thing over another? Right. And, okay, you know, that suggests that there isn't a big strategic benefit to going to the zoo. Or why do you play golf? You know, if I could play golf with people to, you know, get an inside track on a business deal, there's a, there's a benefit there. And so kind of, you know, I, I think we don't need to argue against this because I don't, you know, I always felt those guys were looking at this non non-cost benefit thing, you know, they were saying when there's no cost benefit issue, 
Why do you do one thing versus another? Which then by its nature, it says, well, all right, if we're looking at when there is a cost benefit thing, it's strategic calculations, right? People are rational in what, why they go to play golf instead of visit their kids, right? I'm going to take the kids to the zoo because I don't want my wife to divorce me, or I'm going to take a business deal because I don't want to get fired, right? At that point, rational choice sounds like a very good explanation. So, in, in, I don't mean to be arguing uh, necessarily against uh, what's being presented in, uh, by Buena and Mosquito, but I think that we, we kind of have a couple of red herrings in here. So just for people that come into this, um, keep this in mind. But nevertheless, we're getting we're getting that point of view of hey, this is this is the way people who are committed to rational choice explain things, and. In some, the, the question of whether it is the perfect representation of the world might be a little beyond the point. Uh, and other folks will argue it, certainly constructivists and will, will argue these, these points. However, uh, you know, we can, I think it's making a lot of, uh, out of something that we don't need to. We can say, look, the, if, if you're going to predict conditions where cost benefit and outcomes and you know material interest is at play okay that's when you use the model the fact that there might be situations when you can't you know uh doesn't bother me uh perhaps bruce is but you know bruce is trying to make a point for the broadest applicability of his model and it is very broadly applicable i'm not arguing against that but i think that gets in the way a little bit here The chapter ends up with two other sections, and I've already gone long on this, so I'll try to wrap them up quickly. Bruce talks about the national interest, and he's basically introducing a spatial model of voting, which is not quite game theory, it's more decision theory, more formal modeling of the process, uh, kind of the economic theory of democracy, you know, stuff that's followed on Anthony Downs' work. and. In a spatial model, though, it, you have preferences where an individual has an ideal point. The uh, we can have a one-dimensional space or a two-dimensional space, right? Depend. And here he has a two-dimensional one, and you know points that are closer to the ideal point. You know, each point's a policy, and points that are closer to the ideal point are more preferred. And one of the things you get is that. If you have a status quo and you have this spatial idea here, uh, you can draw these in different circles, right? And so say, look, from uh, if I draw a circle from one player's ideal point through the status quo, everything along that cir circle is e equal in value to the status quo and everything within it, right? Cl that's closer to the ideal point is better. And then if you do that and you, you know, basically you're doing kind of a Venn diagram, the intersecting things and you get this flower and you get what often people talk about the rows or the petals and the petals, which are basically any area in there that is within two, that's inside two of the indifference curves. Well, everything in that is better for two players. And so or, or for two of the three, you know, in, a, in this model, there's three people that would vote and et cetera. So, you know, you can read that and see how it works. Basically, though, this brings out the idea that there can be voting cycles. And Kenneth Arrow identified this, that even if you have rational voters and, you know, a legislature or voters or whatever decision making body, even if they're people with transitive preferences, you can get these uh intransitive outcomes. That is to say, you can get kind of a cycle. And there isn't necessarily an outcome, this sense of the majority that emerges. And that's what he's getting at with national interest, that a lot of outcomes depend on the interaction and very often the strategic behavior of people. Now, in, in his next chapter, he's going to have an example of how you can manipulate an agenda to control the outcome. So really that is gonna play out in, in, in the later chapter. Uh, but it, so it's kind of an interesting thing that he added this here. I it, Like I say, not exactly game theory because the people in it are voting and they're being very decision theoretic. The last thing, again, not quite game theory, is the idea of his, his drug testing example. And he's just, in, in here he's talking about, hey, how do we examine things? And he's 
really going into probability theory and introducing the concept of Bayesian updating, right? How do you model learning, right? And, you know, if you were to teach a computer how to play games, you would use this Bayesian concept. The thing is, we have a model of probability and what evidence when you have some examples, this is the kind of thing that would be more uh, at home in statistics, right? Hey, if we have these outcomes, what are the odds that, you know, this is there? So if we know that drug testing of athletes produces, uh, you know, it's 90%, if someone is positive, you're 90% chance of catching it, but we have a 9% chance of a false positive, and he goes in and said, you know, he has an example where we might end up with a 50-50 chance. That's all just probability theory, not game theory, right? Honestly, it's not game theory because this is kind of the kind of thing we have, we would bring up in decision theory. And it also smacks of procedural rationality, right? This is how people can learn. And this is how we could model it. And this is how we could teach a computer to update and to make estimates. And that is good in forecasting, right? That is, is totally relevant to the concept of forecasting and probably something I should have in my courses, honestly, just kind of, hey, how do we assess these things? And uh, because that could be a very important part of, of making good forecasts. Uh, but when it comes to game theory, you know, do people update? You know, here's the big question. Do people update in this Bayesian manner, right? Or, or, you know, do they, they certainly, most people don't make calculations explicitly the way Bayes does, but do they act as if they do? And here I think it's a stretch, right? And a lot of people uh, aren't very good at this and they don't necessarily do it. And so it's a question of, uh, you know, what do we use this Bayesian thing for? And and it's presented in a theory on game on a, in a chapter on game theory but it is very interesting and i think it's it's i like this book because it doesn't get shoehorned into well we're only going to talk about this and we're going to go forward in this lockstep manner that a lot of text and game theory would do this kind of goes he doesn't color between the lines right he brings up things and so this has got more of a organic, holistic, that is to say, non-linear approach to talking about the subject matter. Um, but those were, that's what these two examples have for them. So, hey, that's a, this has been a long presentation. Groveling apologies. I should probably redo it and make it shorter, but this is what we got for now. So this is chapter two of the Prediction Years, whatever it is, the Prediction Years Guide. <laughs>